Once upon a time, in the roaring 1920s, in the city that never slept, there lived a woman named Ruth Brown Snyder. She was a striking brunette, known for her beauty and a woman with a taste for the finer things in life. Ruth was married to a mild-mannered, bespectacled man named Albert Snyder. On the surface, they appear to be a typical couple living in Queens, New York, but their lives were anything but ordinary. Here is what we know about the Ruth Brown Snyder story. Born in 1895 in New York, Ruth Brown was a determined young woman with aspirations for success. Recognizing that not all occupations would fulfill her ambitions, Ruth made the decision to leave school during the eighth grade and secure a job at a telephone company. Realizing the need to acquire valuable skills, she focused on mastering shorthand and typing with the aim of securing an office position. For Ruth, success wasn't solely determined by job status or income. It encompassed finding genuine love and starting a family. At the age of 19 in 1914, Ruth obtained employment at Motor Boating Magazine where she crossed paths with a handsome man named Albert Snyder. Despite their age difference, with Albert being 32 years old at that time and dedicated to his career, he found himself increasingly captivated by Ruth's presence. Ruth in turn showed no concern about the age gap. Albert proved to be a gentleman and their companionship grew, eventually leading them to marry in 1915. Three years later, their daughter Lorraine was born. Albert remained highly focused on his career and succeeded in providing for his family. They purchased a splendid residence in Queens, New York. However, Albert's dedication to his job and financial success didn't necessarily translate into being an exemplary spouse. Some accounts describe Albert as challenging to work with due to his no-nonsense demeanor. Nevertheless, he cherished his family and strived to meet their needs. On the night of March 20th, 1927, Albert and Ruth attended a party despite Albert's preference for avoiding such social gatherings. The event aligned more with Ruth's inclinations. They departed the party late into the night and returned home at about 1.30 in the morning. After a few hours, a frightened young girl, their daughter, Lorraine Snyder, rushed out of their residence. Seeking refuge, she sought shelter at a neighbor's house, urgently recounting a heroin incident where someone had done the unthinkable to her family. Upon contacting the police, the neighbor, Louis Mailhauser, swiftly made his way to the Snyder residence. Discovering the front door ajar, he entered the premises. Inside, a distressing sight awaited him. Mrs. Snyder was found at the base of the staircase, her legs tightly bound with rope, fighting to remain conscious. Acting promptly, Mr. Mailhauser diligently freed her from the restraints and carried her to a nearby bedroom. However, his attempts to assist were met with a grim discovery. Covered by a blanket, Albert Snyder lay lifeless on the bed, facing downward with a pistol beside him. The arrival of the police at the crime scene was prompt. The scene they encountered was one of utter disarray. The interior of the house had been ransacked. Ruth was located downstairs, separated from her deceased husband, and Mr. Mailhauser provided her with comfort. The authorities first interviewed Mr. Mailhauser, who relayed the information that he had regarding the events. 
how the Snyder's young daughter sought refuge at his home and how he swiftly responded to investigate the situation. New York City Police Commissioner George Vincent McLaughlin displayed a keen interest in this particular case. Arriving at the scene shortly after the police, he commenced an interview with Ruth. The following is an exact transcript of her statement as recorded by the Daily News. She said, we had been to a party at the home of Mr. and Mrs. William Fidgen, 8935 Hollis Court Boulevard in Queens. We had a great time and we drank quite a bit. We got home about 1.30 in the morning. I went upstairs to my room while Albert drove the car to the back. The front door was open for about five minutes. We have separate rooms. Some little time after I went to bed, I got up and thought I heard Lorraine call calling. Lorraine is our daughter. She's nine. As I stepped out of my room and went toward her room, I passed another room, a room where my mother stays when she is with us. A man came out of that room and hit me on the head. I believe that I heard him call to someone downstairs down below. It was about eight o'clock when I awoke. I was stiff and strained bound and gagged. I had a hard time taking the ropes off my hands. Then I took the gag out of my mouth and tried to scream. Following her screams, young Lorraine awoke and emerged from her room. To her horror, she discovered her mother bound and lying on the floor and her father lifeless in bed. Fearing the presence of the assailants inside their home, she hastily fled and sought refuge at Mr. Mailhauser's residence. Ruth managed to provide a vague description of the attacker who assaulted her, a man with a lengthy black mustache, wearing a black slouch hat, and speaking broken English. She never caught sight of the other individual involved. The commissioner proceeded to examine Albert Snyder's lifeless body, confronted with a gruesome scene. The blood-soaked mattress, his battered head suggestive of a severe beating, and the tightness of the picture wire used for strangulation, which had deeply cut into his throat, presented a distressing sight. Furthermore, his pockets were turned inside out, indicating a thorough search. Inquiring about the presence of money, the commissioner asked Ruth if her husband had any cash on him. After considering it, she informed him that Albert had withdrawn over $100, which he would have carried. The notion of a failed robbery began to take shape in the commissioner's mind. He guided Ruth throughout the house, prompting her to identify missing valuable items. She swiftly noticed the absence of precious jewels, including a bracelet and three rings from her jewelry box, as well as an expensive fur coat. One aspect that troubled the commissioner regarding the crime scene was the evident lack of professionalism displayed by the perpetrator. While they targeted the jewelry, a small and discreet item, they also ransacked the kitchen drawers, a noisy and seemingly unprofitable endeavor. The commissioner still had more questions for Ruth and her daughter, but it was necessary to relocate Albert Snyder's body. To ensure a more conducive environment, the interview was scheduled to continue at the police station. As they prepared to leave, reporters had already caught wind of the situation and arrived at the residence. In response to their inquiries about Ruth's potential arrest, the commissioner assured them that she was being brought in for questioning only and was not considered a suspect. Additionally, he provided a detailed description of the assailant witnessed by Ruth with the intention of disseminating the information through the press and enlisting the community's vigilance. Upon reaching the police station, Ruth and Lorraine were separated to provide their official statements to the detectives. As they concluded their testimonies, the commissioner received an intriguing report concerning the crime scene. Remarkably, all the items Ruth had noticed as missing were discovered during the police search concealed beneath her mattress. This discovery sparked a new perspective in the commissioner's mind regarding Ruth. And before questioning Ruth about the perplexing development, the detectives decided to speak with nine-year-old Lorraine. 
They inquired if her parents engage in frequent arguments. Lorraine candidly revealed that they fought incessantly. Commissioner McLaughlin instructed his detectives to explore the possibility that Mrs. Ruth Snyder might be connected to her husband's death. With this new angle in mind, they commenced a thorough search of the residence. However, the commissioner emphasized the importance of not prematurely labeling Ruth as a suspect and urged the detectives to pursue other leads. Consequently, detectives were dispatched to the home of Mr. and Mrs. William Fidgen to gather additional information. The Fidgens, they had hosted the party attended by the Snyders on the night of the murder, and it was believed that they might have valuable insights into this event. Upon reaching their residence, the detectives interviewed both Mr. and Mrs. Fidgen to learn about the proceedings of the party. Mr. Fidgen informed them that the night had been unremarkable with card games being the main activity of the evening. The Fidgens regularly hosted such gatherings. Mrs. Fidgen, who happened to be a close friend of Ruth from their school days, always insisted on bringing Albert along despite the lack of enthusiasm for the parties. At one point during the evening, Albert engaged in a heated argument with Mrs. Fidgen's brother, Mr. George Hoff. It stemmed from Albert's frustration over monetary losses and the situation escalated to the point where they had to be physically separated before it turned physical. When questioned about George's whereabouts after the party, Mr. Fidgen promptly informed the officers that George would have headed straight to his hotel room as it was already quite late. The party concluded shortly after 1 a.m., so George should have arrived at his hotel around that time or shortly thereafter. The detectives quickly eliminated the Fidgens as suspects as there appeared to be no animosity between them and the Snyders. Furthermore, since guests were still present at the Fidgen residence when the attack occurred, their alibi was solid. The detectives proceeded to the hotel where George Hoff was staying and confirmed his account of going straight to his room after the party. His late arrival was corroborated by the hotel staff. Despite having a possible motive, George was ruled out as the murderer, leading to a dead end in, in that aspect of the investigation. Meanwhile, back at the Snyder's home, the detectives conducting the search discovered two potential pieces of evidence. Near the location of Mr. Snyder's murder, they found a small pin with the initials JG engraved on the back. The pin was believed to belong to Mrs. Snyder, raising curiosity as to why she possessed an item with someone else's initials that did not belong to her husband. The second piece of evidence was that they uncovered an address book hidden in the basement, and the book contained the names and addresses of 27 men which was taken to the police station for further scrutiny. The coroner took charge of Mr. Albert Snyder's body. The initial examination of the crime scene left many unanswered questions regarding whether he was killed by strangulation or the severe head injuries. At the police station, one of the detectives carefully examined the address book with a particular theory in mind. If this address book belonged to Ruth and contained the names of men she might have been involved with, the detectives speculated that the initials on the pin could possibly correspond to a name in that book. The pin bore the initials JG, and there just so happened to be a matching entry in the book by the name Judd. Gray. With this revelation, the detectives, accompanied by the commissioner, returned to question Ruth Snyder, intending to intensify their approach. Their initial inquiry concerned the nature of Ruth's relationship with her husband. Ruth explained that she was more of a night owl, while her husband was the opposite, often spending his days out of his boat, which accounted for his tan 
complexion. When asked about the fights, Ruth initially attempted to deny them, but when confronted with her daughter's disclosure, she admitted to the frequent conflicts that plagued their household. The detectives proceeded to inquire about the missing items from the robbery and whether Ruth was aware of their absence. Ruth, she admitted that the items were indeed missing, but when she was informed that they had been found under her mattress, she attempted to downplay the situation. She attributed to her forgetfulness, claiming that she had mistakenly placed them there. The detectives then posed the crucial question. Who is Judd Gray? Ruth's reaction was immediate and distressing. She sat up abruptly, displaying deep concern. The detectives maintained their silence, knowing that it often compels a suspect to continue speaking. Ruth succumbed to this pressure, and her words turned the entire investigation on its head. In a trembling voice, Ruth admitted that she had known Judd Gray for nearly two years. Their relationship extended beyond mere friendship, and for the majority of their time together, they had been involved in an affair behind her husband's back. Ruth revealed that they had discussed killing her husband on multiple occasions, with poisoning being their preferred method, although they had failed to carry it out. On the night of the murder, Gray had hidden, waiting for their return. Once Albert had fallen asleep, Ruth had let Gray into the house. They had premeditated the murder to appear as a robbery. Gray had taken a heavy object and proceeded upstairs, striking Albert Snyder twice on the head before using picture wire to complete the act. According to Ruth, aside from allowing Gray into the house, she had no further involvement in her husband's death. She placed full responsibility on Gray. The detectives then questioned her about the pin discovered on the floor. Ruth's reaction was displeased as she recounted the story of her husband's first love, Jesse Gouchard, who had given Albert the pin shortly before her death. He had cherished it ever since, and no other woman could compare to Jesse, his first love. Although the assumption about the pin had inadvertently led them to the truth, it was a fortunate coincidence. Judd Gray was located and apprehended at a hotel in Syracuse, New York. The police conducted a search of his room, recovering a metal bar and torn clothing but no direct evidence linking him to the murder. Gray staunchly denied the allegations against him. When brought in for questioning, the detectives informed him of Ruth's confession and their certainty of his involvement. However, Gray vehemently insisted that he had no part in the crime, even signing an affidavit to that effect. In the affidavit, he says, I am 34 years old. I will be 35 years of age on July 8, 1927. I am married. I live with my wife, Mrs. Isabella Gray. I have one daughter, Jane, 10 years old. We live in East Orange, New Jersey. I was born in Portland, New York. My father is dead. My mother resides at West Orange, New Jersey. About March 7th, I left my home on my business trip through New York State. I have known Albert Snyder's wife, whose name is Ruth Brown Snyder, for the past two years. I was introduced to her in either May or June of 1925 by Harry Paulson. He admitted that he picked her up through a flirtation in the restaurant. From that time on, I became a friendly with her. I have talked with the mother and the daughter, but I have never met or talked to Albert Snyder. I swear that I have not seen or talked with Ruth Snyder in person since about the fourth week in February in 1927, or the first week in March of the same year. The last time that I talked with Mrs. Ruth Snyder was on Thursday night, March 17th, from the Hotel Seneca at Rochester. I stopped there Wednesday night, March 16th, and Thursday night, March 17th. I checked out of the hotel on Friday, March 18th, between 5 and 6 p.m., and arrived at Syracuse at 8.15. I went directly to the hotel Onondaga. I stayed there from 
Friday night until about 2 a.m. on March 21st when I was brought into the police headquarters for investigation. The officer found the gray roll, a pair of rubber gloves, an iron pitch bar, and a pair of brown Oxford shoes which were in my hotel room. I had taken the same out of my trunk which I had sent to the Syracuse trunk company Saturday morning, March 19, to have repaired. Since knowing Mrs. Snyder, I have visited her on a number of different occasions. The only time that she ever accompanied me was on an automobile trip. We were gone about a week through New York State. She left her daughter with her mother. I swear that I know nothing about who committed the murder and swear that I had no part in the murder in any shape or form. The police held both of them overnight. The papers went crazy over the story and reported on everything that came out as it happened. The continued press brought more and more evidence out into the public eye. A man who worked at a nearby hotel told officers that he had letters for Mr. Gray from Ruth. She would mail them to the hotel so that Mrs. Gray would never see them. When detectives retrieved the mail and read it, it gave them more ammunition. The letters were from Mrs. Snyder. She was telling Gray that she was so excited about something they believed that it was her husband's murder that they would be committing soon. Ruth signed each letter with love your mommy. This was leaked to the press and they had a field day with it. Some papers would now only call Ruth Gray's mommy. From this point on, poking fun at the situation. Both Ruth and Gray were charged with the murder of Albert Snyder, but on March 22, 1927, they both pled not guilty, citing the other as the actual murderer. Ruth's attorney believed that she would be acquitted when they heard the entire story. She could not be found guilty of a murder she didn't commit. Gray's attorney stated that his client didn't commit the murder and that even though he was there, it was Ruth who did the killing. Both Ruth and Gray were tried together. They each accused the other of actually killing Mr. Albert Snyder. The procession argued that they both planned it. They used the letters as evidence, the confessions, and the autopsies all as evidence. According to Gray, they both hit Albert over the head with the heavy weight. When Gray did it, Albert tried to get up. That was when Ruth took the weight and also hit Albert over the head. They then strangled him with the picture wire. According to the coroner, when they tried to strangle Albert, he was already dead. The blows to the head are what killed him. At the trial, Ruth tried to convince the jury that she had no hand in her husband's murder. That Gray did it on his own. She said that Gray forced her to do things like upping Albert's life insurance from 15000 to 25000 When Gray attacked her husband, she tried to stop him, but Gray shoved her to the ground, and by the time she was able to get up, he was finished and Albert was dead. Gray testified that they both planned the murder and that she help. So much so, it was her actions that killed Albert. She had used him because she knew that he was in love with her. She tricked him into killing her husband and that the act was entirely her fault. He even reenacted the murder for the jury so that they would know what actually happened. When the case went to the jury, they deliberated for only 98 minutes. When they came back, they announced their verdict. They found that Judd Gray and Ruth Snyder were guilty of murder in the first degree. They fixed death as their sentence. On January 12, 1928, both Judd and Ruth would be executed back to back. They had Judd go first. When they came for him, he had just read a letter from his wife forgiving him for what he had done. This brought him much peace. He walked into the chamber and spent his last words warning others of doing wrong. He then sat down and was put to death. Ruth would be next. She was led in by guards and allowed 
to speak. It was noted that she was acting erratically and had seemed to have aged quite a bit since the trial. She stated that she was too young to die and asked God to forgive them because they knew not what they were doing to her. She then prayed and they began the procedure and she was dead after three whole minutes on the chair. A reporter for the Daily News had snuck a small camera into the death chamber. He took the first ever picture of electrocution. The picture of Ruth Snyder's last moments is forever captured on film. It soon became the most remarkable execution photos in criminal history. Following the pronouncement of the death sentence on Ruth Snyder in May of 1927, legal disputes arose between the relatives regarding the care of Ruth and Albert's daughter Lorraine, who was nine years old at the time. Warren Snyder, brother of Albert, petitioned to be allowed to appoint a legal guardian who was not a member of Ruth's family. Josephine Brown, mother of Ruth, also petitioned for custody of the girl. Lorraine had been in the care of Brown since the murder. Lorraine was formally placed by her maternal grandmother in the Catholic institution where she had been residing at the time of her mother's execution. Ruth requested that her daughter not be brought to the prison for a final final visit. On September 7th, 1927, Josephine Brown was awarded guardianship of the girl. While incarcerated on death row, Ruth Snyder wrote a sealed letter which she requested to be given to Lorraine when she is old enough to understand. One year after her mother's execution, Lorraine was apparently aware that her parents were both dead, but not of the manner of either of their deaths. Ruth was imprisoned at Sing Sing in Austin, in New York. On January 12, 1928, she became the first woman to be executed at Sing Sing since Martha Place in 1899, and the third woman to be executed by the state of New York. That is the story of Ruth Brown Snyder, plotted and acted on killing her husband.